where people talk about how Bitcoin's a hedge to inflation. And now they don't understand why, hey, if Bitcoin's a hedge to inflation, why did it come down? And there's this whole like massive credit bubble and the dollar was deleveraging and everything. Bitcoin is not a hedge to inflation. It is the solution to inflation, the permanent solution. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm here with Will and Parker. Guys, welcome to Bitcoin Fundamentals on the Investors Podcast. Good to be here, Preston. One of the things that uh, I just see this theme kind of coming up and you see a lot of it maybe being missed with a lot of the proof of stake conversations. And I don't want to like pull that up here into the front of the conversation, but what I do want to talk about here at the beginning is just uh, energy and Bitcoin. And Parker, I know you have talked about this quite a bit and how these two sectors are merging, whether the energy sector realizes it or not. And I think the Bitcoin uh, mining, I think they definitely see where this is kind of the direction some of this is going. But for people that are joining us and maybe not dialed into all this, explain to them from a very top level kind of framework of why these two things are coming together in, in a rapid pace. Yeah, absolutely. So since I've been helping to organize the Houston Bitcoin meetup over the past year and a half or so, um, I've started to pay a lot closer attention, not just to the mining side of Bitcoin and proof of work, but also uh, the energy um, sector as a whole, but also kind of how it interplays with Bitcoin. And and I've started to, to learn a lot more about energy and power production and drilling and natural gas and oil. And I think that to, to start on the context of Bitcoin, and we can, we can talk about it in the context of proof of work and proof of stake, is that I like to simplify Bitcoin down to being of fundamental value to the world because there will only ever be 21 million. And that the killer app or the real fundamental value in Bitcoin is that it affords everyone the opportunity to be able to opt into a form of money that can't be printed. And that there are a lot of people, um, you know, myself included, who, you know, at least up until the last 18 months, and I'm still on my rapid descent down the, the energy rabbit hole, that, uh, that take, take energy for granted. And how I relate that to Bitcoin, though, is that everyone took money for granted. And that there's a lot of people that, that think that Bitcoin wastes energy, um, but people who do not understand why Bitcoin is of fundamental value to the world could never understand or justify the amount of energy necessary to, to protect it and to secure it. And if all value in Bitcoin derives from the fact that there will only ever be 21 million, uh, you don't get something in va of value in the world without a cost. And in this case, um, and, and in Bitcoin's case, that part of the core backbone of what secures Bitcoin and what enforces that fixed supply of 21 million is real world energy. Um, there's There are a number of other intricate puzzle pieces that also secure Bitcoin, uh, but the energy component of it, the, the thing that makes it very costly to, to forge Bitcoin transactions or to write invalid Bitcoin transactions to, to the Bitcoin open public ledger uh, is energy. And that the consequence of that is that, you know, Bitcoin is money, uh, at least in my view, and, and energy is what secures it. And, and, and what Bitcoin represents to energy is a fundamentally new source of demand um, and a, a new incentive to develop energy resources. And that, that will have profound implications for the energy industry as a whole. Uh, and I think a lot of us always focus on the money side, but, but the world of Bitcoin and energy are, are rapidly converging to one. And what I've seen in the last 18 months is that uh, you know it, it certainly feels like we've crossed over a tipping point where the energy industry as a whole, and it's not just oil and gas, but also the power sector, maybe more importantly, the power sector is starting to figure out that this, this thing, Bitcoin can really um, not only help solve a problem, um, but, but also uh, be a huge source of, of profit for their businesses. So happy to go into to, to more detail there, but, um, but, I, but I really do think that that Bitcoin will help transform energy as much as it transforms uh, money, albeit I am still someone who is, you know, I, I don't consider myself an energy expert. No, I know just enough to be dangerous. Will? No, I mean, uh, I, I agree with Parker. I got into this, um, you know, not from the mining and energy side, but 
after attending the Houston meetups in particular, which, um, you know, since the Chinese ban on, on mining, uh, as it were, um, a lot of that, uh, a lot of those companies and a lot of that hash powers, you know, flocked to Texas and this has become kind of a central point for those discussions. Um, no, I mean, you know, everything of value, I mean, gold has the same issue, right? You know, gold's price determines how much energy is expended to extract more from the ground. When it goes up, we can expend more energy. We can get more gold. Um, Bitcoin has other, you know, uh, safety measures in place where you can't get more Bitcoin. But uh, at the same time, uh, understanding that nothing of value comes without expending energy and that um, uh, when I think of proof of stake, as you mentioned at the very beginning, you know, it, it much more resembles like sort of, uh, you know, shareholder uh, voting uh, agreements or, or governance and in, in, um, in like a public stock or something like that. I don't think that's where value comes from. Um, and in order for Bitcoin to have value, proof of work is essential for it. One thing I was just going to add there, you know, kind of leveraging off of Will's point is that. One other way that I think about proof of work and, and Bitcoin mining is that um, really, and, and this kind of comes back to a fundamental point around money, which is, and again, this, this is my perspective, but I also believe it to be a, a fundamental economic truth is that um, we all truthfully only need one form of money. There, it's not coincidence that most of us have only ever interacted and traded with one form of money, that money converges in a consensus forms. Um, because it's actually necessary to converge in order to solve a problem of trade. And that's functionally what money does. And that via Bitcoin's proof of work, along with a number of other puzzle pieces, it actually solved this problem. And, and, and when I talk about solving a problem, it is being able to issue and validate currency and for everyone be, being able to uh, credibly rely on the fact that there will only ever be 21 million or more importantly, that there will only be a fixed amount of money without the need for trust. The credibility of that is important and without the need for trust of that is important. And proof of work was critical to that equation. And, and if money converges to one, then, and Bitcoin already solved the problem, then any other arguments around proof of stake of whether it works or doesn't work. It can only work as well as Bitcoin already does. And, and more importantly, and this is the Will's point, the, the proof of stake system, part of that proof of work function separated ownership from validation and security of the network, um, such that everyone within the Bitcoin network has equal rights. The consensus rules are the consensus rules and nobody can change them. Um, and what, what effectively a proof of stake system does much like JP Morgan, Chase, and Wells Fargo and Bank of America, it combines validation with ownership. And um, what we've seen historically is that that has really bad outcomes. And we actually solve this problem via Bitcoin and proof of work. And we would basically just be uninventing the wheel or, or going back to, to a screwed up world. And so the proof of work function is, is not only very necessary, but it, but it functionally obsoletes the need for any other form of money in the context of Bitcoin, which therefore obsoletes you know, the need to try to, to, to even think about proof of stake because the best it can do is match Bitcoin, being able to credibly enforce a fixed supply without the need for trust. It can't do that, but part of the reason why it can't do that is because Bitcoin and proof of work already solved the problem. So you were getting into a little bit of, uh, in proof of stake, how it has this JP Morgan-like uh, fiat-based incentive structure built into it. There was recently a video that came out this week where a person was talking about the Ethereum merge and all of the concerns that they had around regulatory capture. And what they were getting at is by people staking their coins in order to do the validation of the new supposed uh, protocol that's going to be rolled out with Ethereum, uh, that there's regulatory capture happening at the exchange level because people are incentivized to just take their coins, put them on, put them on the exchange, and then all of a sudden the government can come in there and tell the exchange what it is they are or aren't going to do with all those coins that are being staked into, into the exchange's hands. And so... Talk to us about your thoughts on how you see this progressing through time. Do you agree with him? Do you see it uh, maybe even being worse than that, better than that? What What are your thoughts? I mean, I'll start. I, 
yeah, I mean, I, I see, I see some of that, uh, the regulatory capture side of it, it, you're starting to combine different layers of counterparty risk, right? You, you already already had certain amount of risk of having your coins on the exchange to begin with, and now layer on top of it that you're trying to get you know certain rewards from staking from that, and that you're putting a target on pretty much anyone who wants to have a say in the uh, protocol's development. Uh, you're putting a target on their back, um, making it very easy for you know governments and um, uh, to to influence decisions on the protocol level. But also, I mean, uh, is this is this not true? I could be I, I could be wrong here, so I don't I don't want to you know say any uh, untruths. But uh, uh, I think it's also true, at least at the beginning, very similar to like the beacon chain that you can uh, stake on right now, is that you can't withdraw. Like once you make that decision to stake, you're you're essentially locked up, and that's an indeterminate amount of time. And there's even more risk uh, other than just uh, regulatory or typical exchange counterparty risk there, which is the same risk of what happened to Celsius, right? Which is um, crazy. Which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate to interrupt you. But that's nuts. Yeah, it's just risk later on top of risk later on top of risk. The sort of regulatory capture risk. I mean, it doesn't even have to be uh, a government having malicious ideas of how to control the protocol. But if you're on an exchange, you're already you're already subjecting yourself to jurisdictional risk of where that exchange is located. If they're in New York and they decide that you know proof of work rules and proof of stake is terrible, or vice versa, you're again, risk layered on top of risk layered on top of risk. So yeah, I mean, I haven't read that or seen that video yet, but uh, I would tend to agree that uh, the incentive to keep things in uh, on an exchange in general, um, in addition to the risk that already exists, uh, is going to be bad for the protocol overall. Yeah, it's 100% a centralizing force, but I always try to come back to the fundamental, which is Bitcoin already obsoleted all other forms of money. Everyone else is just catching up. And that if we are going to, you know, kind of talk about it, it is it, like the most important part of this whole thing is that in order to affect it, it requires um, a hard fork. And, you know, other protocols do this all, all the time. But when I talked about, you know, the, the fundamental value in Bitcoin um, deriving from the fact that there will only ever be 21 million and that that that, that happens credibly, and without the need for trust, well, that is dependent on decentralization. Um, and proof of work functionally just continues to decentral further and further decentralize the Bitcoin network. It's not the only layer at which Bitcoin decentralizes over time. Um, but the mere fact of, quote, changing a protocol the, that, that that's even possible demonstrates in front of everyone's face that the thing is so centralized that you could change the rules. And um, that defeats the entire purpose because if one rule can change, then any rule can change. And this obviously isn't the first time this happens with other protocols on a quarterly basis. Uh, it, it's pretty comical, I think, to the people in, in the Bitcoin world who are paying attention. Um, but just like with a lot of things, there's a lot of noise in the world and people have to figure out by touching the hot stove. And hopefully podcasts like these help people kind of uh, learn without having to deposit their Bitcoin in a Celsius or, you know, God forbid, hold their former money in something other than Bitcoin, and then uh, even worse, potentially uh, have it be in, in, in an even worse position than just being on the exchange, but uh, but but it's staked on an exchange. So, Parker, you had mentioned earlier that you uh, were doing this Bitcoin meetup down in Houston. I would imagine you have some major players out of the energy sector participating in these in these meetings. Is is that the case? And uh, is there anything that you've heard or seen just on that front that has kind of surprised you or that you think is noteworthy? Yeah, I, th I think that um, there's certainly people from the majors who come through. I mean, it's a it's an open meetup. We we, we don't check uh, IDs and and uh, and also we we do value privacy. But um, it, it's really interesting because if if anybody's ever been to Austin Bit Devs, and for those that aren't familiar, we host the Austin Bitcoin developers meet up uh, at the Bitcoin Commons downtown in Austin. And if you walk in that room, it's a it's a group of developers that are working. Um, you know, there's a mix of people, but uh, it's a very tech centric group that's that's working on protocol development or application development that uh, is impacted by protocol development. When you walk in the Houston meetup, it is an entirely different complexion. It is an energy first group of people, um, and it you know. It's, it's not just oil and gas 
drillers and landmen, uh, it's power producers. And I think that what I've seen, and there's, you know, kind of a combination, but there are people who come through the meetup um, that work at the majors. There's, there's private oil and gas. Uh, there's large power producers. There's power brokers. And, you know, they kind of have different cross sections where some end up focusing on on grid. And those might be, you know, power producers that are um, kind of a key part of the supply chain to building substations or uh, manufacturing transformers or um, procuring power or producing power. But then there are also oil and gas guys that, that are focused more off grid of how Bitcoin mining can, can solve a problem there. So my, I'd say my greatest takeaway, you know, kind of zooming out is that the energy industry, I wouldn't maybe say as a whole, but that we've crossed over a critical point, a, a tipping point where enough people have figured it out that there's real signal here that it's only going to accelerate, that enough people have looked at this and said, you know what, there's something real here and it can solve a problem. And once you cr cross over a critical mass, there's no going back. And, and, and that what we're witnessing right now is, is an acceleration uh, in terms of the convergence between the energy sector and Bitcoin. You think we're there right now. We've already passed over that. Yeah, I think we've passed over the critical mass. And Will, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, in Texas, it's obvious, but you know, right now I'm sitting in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and you know, I've been having these discussions here for I don't know since 2014 or so. And um, the big, the big holdup here, you know, off grid has become uh, very popular here uh, amongst you know, not not even you know, oil and gas people, just landowners. Um, uh, but um, but the utilities were always the you know more difficult. Um, you know, side of the equation in Wyoming. And we've seen a lot of uh, deals being made just in the past year, um, uh, new capacity that will come online over the next, you know, six, eight months in, in the state here, because, you know, after seven years of, of trying to wrap their heads around this, there is sort of a tipping point that's been reached. And, you know, honestly, Texas has sort of set the standard. There's jealousy involved. There's, uh, you know, if they can do it, we can do it. Um, obviously, Texas has a lot of advantages given, you know, the nature of their independent grid um, and the size of that grid um, already being what over, I think it's 70, 77 gigawatts or so um, uh, of capacity. So, you you know, places like North Dakota and Wyoming are going to have to catch up. But off grid, you know, it's very, very exciting here um, amongst the oil and gas people, landowners, and then even on grid, uh, you, you see it happening. Uh, th there's hardly a discussion that happens uh, or a meetup uh, in the state where there isn't some contingency from the energy sector present and uh, participating. Yeah, one thing too, um, like I didn't want to like over oversell it in terms of there's still a lot of people from the energy sector that don't understand Bitcoin, and I'm not suggesting that there's 50% of people and now, you know, the other 50% are going to be dragged along. But I'm talking about enough of a contingent that looks at this and says there is something real here, and being able to see month after month um, the the type of crowds and the type of people, and that they are energy first people, right? They are. They're oil and gas operators. They are energy professionals across the industry where it's not, they weren't Bitcoin miners and then started to learn about oil and gas and power production. And that one of the things that I've witnessed is that uh, a number of people got into Bitcoin to solve a problem, whether it was they, they had drilled a well and um, they had natural gas that was stranded and that wouldn't have been economical to, to build a pipeline and Bitcoin solved the problem for them. Another kind of story that that one producer out in West Texas told at the not the last meetup, but the meetup before was that a permit got pulled because I think it was I can't quote the number, but 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 on an order of magnitude, it was like a twenty thousand MCF pipeline, and uh, got a got a permit pulled because they were flaring like four hundred MCF a day, and went to the railroad commissioner and said, if I show up with Bitcoin miners and capture this flare, am I can I get my permit? Yes. Um, and then in other instances, you know, I think um, people in the in, in the power sector started selling infrastructure or helping procure power and working on PPAs for, for Bitcoin miners, just recognizing that there was a signal that they could, they, that there was end demand and that it was worth investing their time and energy in. And now they're backfilling on the Bitcoin knowledge side. And we're at that point where enough of them have, have started to, to find the true signal that uh, I, I think this is true in all cases when peers hear things from themselves rather than 
um, you know, Bitcoin enthusiast telling them about how Bitcoin is the best form of money, but it's more Bitcoin can solve a problem um, and they can actually see it and hear it from their peers. Uh, that that's the point where we're at, where there are a sufficient number of those that that nobody gets. I don't want to say nobody, but but it's a lot harder to laugh people out of the room. And, and once we get to that point, um, a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators, which is core to the energy industry, not just in Texas but uh, in America, that when they get turned on to something, that that it's off to the races. You know, uh, this past week I saw something about BlackRock coming out and basically saying that they found Bitcoin to be uh, in alignment with their ESG initiatives and that it wasn't uh, bad for the environment. And to be quite honest with you, I was kind of blown away and I thought it was a really big deal. And not because I, I put this importance on BlackRock necessarily. I mean, they've got trillions. It's more because of all the companies out there that are cramming ESG down the throat of every company board on the planet, it's them. And I, I, I guess I was just kind of surprised that, to see this out of them because I would have expected the exact opposite. Were you guys surprised by this? Is this, is, is this a bigger deal or is this a nothing burger? What are your thoughts? I mean... When you put it that way, if you're at the top of the food chain of a, you know, as a confidence trickster around like a scheme like ESG, you kind of get to set the terms, right? And so, am I glad? Like, yeah, it makes things a little bit easier, right? I don't know yeah. if it's genuine or if it's just because all of their clients are begging them to get into Bitcoin and use the vehicles that they have in order to do it. In order to do that, they had to come up with their own narrative. I happen to think that they're right, right? I'm not sure if they think that if they would agree with me on the reasons that, uh, that, that they're right. Um, I won't complain. Uh, but, uh, no, I mean, like I, I see it as kind of like a unholy alliance, but you know, one that works in our favor for now. <laughs> I agree with that. I totally agree with, with that. <laughs> Go ahead, Parker. I, I would just say like the whole ESG thing is a fraud. They're all scammers. Tell us right? why. Tell us why. Go, go into details. Because does BlackRock give a shit about, conserving the environment and social good. No, they, they, they care about making money and charging investment management fees. And um, I think that the whole premise to think that the people that, you know, incepted this and then push the rules actually give a shit about the things that they espouse, you know, like they don't actually care and it's all about control. Um, and and I and I think that the more that you pay attention to this, that that it's obvious. And so, like in this case, I'd say beware of the you know wolf in sheep's clothing, which is they recognize an opportunity to make money, they back solve the rules, and then they'll do things to you know just like they've done to the oil and gas industry. Um, they neuter it, right? They 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 figure out how they can they can make money off it but then they virtue signal or do whatever they want to do to, to control the behavior that, that they want. And they do that via the money system. Right. And so I think that, that I would be, I'd be very cautious around this of celebrating it because I think, you know, I, I would say ESG is a fraud and therefore Bitcoin's not ESG um, that, that Bitcoin will, will do all the things that all of the people who espouse to have principles around ESG just, because of the incentive structures around hard money and that, um, that we should celebrate um, the energy producers, um, particularly natural gas, particularly oil. Uh, it is our lifeblood. And, uh, and if they could, if BlackRock could basically make the entire energy industry bend their knees, that uh, just because they see a profit opportunity, don't think that they're going to to not try to influence things just the way that they have and in ways that have been incredibly harmful for, for our energy stability and security. So um, I think, you know, when, when you get down to the brass tacks, we should not be celebrating BlackRock's, you know, kind of working with Coinbase to, to enter into Bitcoin. I mean, it's fine, right? Like I don't, I'm not worried about it at the same time. I just wouldn't be out there being a champion for, for BlackRock because uh, the incentive structures are broken and, 
they they don't actually give a shit about you know anything other than their investment management fees and exerting control. Like they exert control through the financial system here in the state of Texas. Um, the it was either the I think it was the lieutenant governor sent um, a letter to the comptroller basically saying um, that you know Larry Fink I believe who's the CEO of BlackRock came out and said that, you know, they're supporting a net zero policy. Mm-hmm. And um, the the Texas Lieutenant Governor basically instructed the comptroller to pull all funds. I don't think it actually happened, um, but to pull all funds from BlackRock, BlackRock managed funds because a net zero policy was um, destructive to the Texas energy industry. And the, the, the Texas State House had passed a law that public funds could not be invested with anyone that um, from a financial perspective, that, that worked in opposition to an industry that is important and strategic to Texas. And that, in this case, I'm almost positive was BlackRock. So um, yeah, I, I would, I'd follow the incentives and, and, and just watch for the next move. If, you know, someone like Marathon, now they reverse course, but if they started getting into ESG mining um, and, and we start labeling what is and isn't okay in terms of um, what energy can be consumed to secure the Bitcoin network? That's a really bad path, and BlackRock has a really bad track record. Love shake, that. Shake, shake down artists will find a way to shake you down eventually. So. <laughs> I like that, Will. That's so true. Um, you know, I, I just like the way Jeff Booth frames a lot of this, where he says, "If the money isn't scarce, everything that's desirable on the planet will become scarce." And when I just look at you're you're seeing this narrative run around on on Twitter quite a bit where we've got a quote unquote energy crisis, and I think for people that are looking at it without any type of uh, understanding of financial markets or what's kind of playing out with fiat currency, I would rephrase or recage that as we have a fiat crisis where banks and BlackRock being one of the major you know, players in all of this that are pulling strings are flooding the planet with fiat currency. And as a result, the things that truly are valued, and I think you're seeing the barometer in energy first and foremost, especially over in Europe, um, those charts are, I got, I got a chart I'm going to pull up a little bit later, um, the, some of the electricity costs and things like that. I mean, it's like Weimar hyperinflation looking charts. And I think that's the barometer. That's how you're actually seeing the crisis, which is a fiat currency crisis. And the desirable thing that everybody wants is energy because it's at the core of, of everything. So um, sorry to go on there. I just, I'm just kind of piggybacking and, and agreeing with everything you guys just said. I think it's important for people to have their guard up, but I did find that that quite interesting this week <laughs> with their announcement. Uh, what do you guys think about paper Bitcoin? Caitlin Long talks about this quite a bit and just concerns of the financing of Bitcoin and turning it into paper Bitcoin and then people owning that and losing touch with reality of, of what it is they even own and whether there's a way for regulatory capture, similar to like what we were talking about with proof of stake. In Ethereum, does Bitcoin have a concern if, from your vantage point in this area? Is this something that the community's got to be careful with? I know that this has been a long-term concern of every gold bug you know, I've known since you know 2006 or so. They've always explained it to me. And I'm sure there's, you know, monkey business that goes on, you know, um, you know, with the paper gold and the paper Bitcoin. At the same time, uh, like, zoom out enough and I don't really worry about it. Uh, I, I think it's kind of a loser's argument at the end of the day um, is that, uh, you know, first of all, you have no control over, you know, how those things, you know, turn out and what, what regulations get passed and, you know, whether there's going to be futures markets and whether there's going to be ETFs and whether there's going to be all these things and how they, how they end up getting regulated is that I don't think it ultimately matters for Bitcoin long term. I admit that there are probably schemes in order to try to depress the price over a short term uh, that, that that could be deployed. But um, in Bitcoin's case, um, 
again, I see it as kind of a loser's argument because, you know, what else are you going to do? Uh, there's being concerned about it doesn't matter. Build things that are valuable. Bitcoin has a core value proposition that exists with or without, you know, these paper Bitcoin markets um, that most of the people that play in that world are going to get rug pulled anyway because Bitcoin's a bare instrument. And just like the gold people have learned, um, you know, there's no substitute to actually holding Bitcoin. Yeah. And I think the other thing I would just add there is, um, that uh, while very few people in the in the U.S. financial system can take physical delivery of gold or do, uh, you can take physical delivery of Bitcoin, and that you know if if you borrow borrow Bitcoin, and presumably the only reason to borrow Bitcoin today is to short it or to sell it, that if you are borrowing Bitcoin and shorting it, you can only do. It's not say someone can't buy that Bitcoin and lend it out again. But, but, but in that individual operation, you can only short it once. And what you do is you create demand on the other side. If you're short Bitcoin, then you need to purchase it back. And using the perfect example, so I think as Will stated it, it was perfectly correct, which is you could potentially manipulate the price over the short term. Uh, you can't over the long term. The, the, the perfect example of that is Celsius. Celsius, people deposit their Bitcoin in Celsius, and Celsius lent that out, and now... Celsius doesn't have the Bitcoin. Bitcoin eliminates moral hazard. When Bitcoin are lent and they are lost, there are no bailouts. And those Bitcoin that, that Celsius lent out that were sold, uh, they're in somebody else's hand. They're in someone else's cold storage. And uh, the market cannot ultimately be manipulated over the long term because Bitcoin supply cannot be manipulated. The supply of paper gold can be manipulated, but you can't functionally take that paper gold and say, give me the physical gold. Um, that it's mostly hedge funds that have no interest in owning the physical. Uh, and in Bitcoin's case, if Bitcoin gets onto an exchange and then is withdrawn, it's withdrawn. And it's secured by private keys. And there will only ever be 21 million. There's currently 19 million of issuance. All 19 million of those Bitcoin are controlled by keys. And if Bitcoin was sold to you and you withdrew it to your own keys, that those short-term financialization manipulation games that can happen cannot be sustained because the Bitcoin is all accounted for by someone, right? And uh, and that when you live in a world where you can take delivery at virtually no cost and secure it at very low cost, you're incentivized to do that. Um, and then when the tide goes out, those who are swimming naked uh, are revealed. In this case, it was you know Celsius, other platforms, Three Arrows, BlockFi's got issues. Um, so I, I really don't worry about it. And also kind of coming from a world of, of having shorted stock, you know, again, you can only short stock once, you know, you yeah. can short more of it, but then you got to buy it back on the other side. So every time you create a liability, um, it, it's creating artificial demand on the other side. So as much as you might suppress it, you're going to send it the other way on, uh, uh, you know, on the back end. So I, I really do believe this is noise. I mean, I understand why, why people have concerns over it, but when you get into the fundamentals of actually understanding the flow of funds and the ability to influence price, I, I really, it's a non issue in my world. I agree with you guys. Yeah, go ahead, Will. I was just going to say, I, I have concerns, but they're for the people that buy paper Bitcoin, not for the yeah. marketplace of paper Bitcoin. Yeah. And yeah, if it would, is double, if it is double lent out, that your borrowing costs just keep going up and up, right? Which is only making that realization. Uh, point of realization to the timeline to slide further and further to the left. Um, I'll just say this. If you're buying Bitcoin futures and not a uh, physical Bitcoin taking delivery, you're, you're, do you're uh, playing the wrong game. <laughs> so true. So true. And, and I think for people, especially in the gold community, you mentioned this will um, that feel like they've been burned in this area. Um, I would just challenge a person, if you've never taken physical custody of Bitcoin and you either have or haven't taken physical custody of gold, mm -hmm. start your stopwatch and do it and then secure it after you, after you eventually receive it. One's going to come a lot faster than the other. Um, then secure it and uh, look at the deltas between those two approaches. And then I think people will understand why I think the physical market isn't nearly the concern that you have in the physical, in the, the physical gold market. I mean, it's one of the primary things that Bitcoin outcompetes gold on, right? And make sure when, when you're doing that transaction that your counterparty's in France. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
you guys are with Unchained and Unchained takes a lot of pride in helping people hold on to their own keys and help people secure their Bitcoin in, in any kind of way. Do you guys have anything brewing, any new products, anything that you think will help people take ownership so we don't have more paper Bitcoin? But what are you guys up to these days? Well, you know, I mean, I think just like at the core of it, and it's, and it's part and parcel with this discussion, which is what we ultimately do and what the foundation of our, our platform is helping people hold their own keys. And so when we think about what's happened in the markets over the last three months, Bitcoin, I hate using the term crypto more, more broadly, um, but that like the, all these discussions that we've been having about kind of um, the state of the markets, the, the consequences of what's happening in the broader markets, um, ultimately in Bitcoin comes down to the ability to how you secure it. And that uh, the, the the key differentiator in Bitcoin um, and the key differentiator kind of in terms of the currency itself and how you can hold it, but also the network is that it's permissionless. It's permissionless, it's, it's decentralized, anybody can access it um, and anybody can transmit Bitcoin to anyone in the world. Um, and that the most, I'd say, core thing, at least to me about that is the ability to hold Bitcoin with your own private keys. Because it doesn't matter what anybody else in the world is doing. If you can control your private keys, um, then, then then you have the ability, uh, whether, you know, truthfully, whether you have a node or not, you can spin up a node and, and that becomes your permissionless access to the network. But if you have your own keys, you're controlling your wealth and you can take that wherever you want and, and go where, wherever you want to in the world. And so really that's at the core of what we do. Um, and that's, you know, kind of our, our underlying mission. And we continue to build that out. We'll be in BitBlock Boom Week and we, we are um, planning to, to make an announcement there. But it's really just an extension of, of, what it, of, of what our core mission is, which is helping more and more people hold their own private keys. Um, but we're kind of going to expand what kind of had initially been a, a private launch around the trading side. Will, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but, but really kind of we focus on the you know kind of private key ownership expanding that base solving a lot of these problems that people have um, come to to face in these last few months around losing their bitcoin or giving it to a to somebody they shouldn't have and we're just trying to to kind of further that mission by being able to to help more people hold their own keys and and also being able to buy directly there well if you want to kind of go into more detail will can you spill the beans on something yeah. So without bearing the lead, yeah, the okay. idea is, uh, you know, buy Bitcoin directly to cold storage with keys that you control uh, with an added value proposition of um, affecting final settlement faster than any place else in the world. Right. So um, if you have an unchained vault that you are sovereign over the keys uh, and over the funds, we can affect final settlement Bitcoin in your hands faster than anyone. Like in the next block, it's it's straight into your vault or, or what? Well, it depends. We take USD through wires to speed things up, you know, because that's the fastest uh, fiat um, settlement. So if you've pre-funded like a large amount or something like that, then then typically within the next hour or two, we can we can um, affect final settlement. Typically, for most people, it'd be like T plus one. Once the wire clears, then we set off an operation to to settle the, the Bitcoin to your vault. And of course, that's that's the entire thing that we're going to be working on over the next you know year. You know, the idea being you know. As we get MTLs around the United States, uh, you can pre-fund those vaults. Uh, therefore, like the USD settlement side has already taken place. And therefore, when you execute a trade, you know, if we're signing, you know, multiple times a day, you'll get same day settlement that way. Uh, you compare that, you know, even to an exchange, even if you've pre-funded, you're subject to withdrawal limits, uh, you know, oftentimes, unless you have some sweetheart deal. Um, so if you've let things build up or you're doing a large purchase, it can take, you know, quite a while. If you're, you know, DCAing on a, on a platform like Square, which I love, uh, I've used, but uh, Bitcoin then triples in price and you have uh, weekly withdrawal limits. It could take you weeks to get, to get your Bitcoin off. This is sort of like um, in my own personal story, something that I've wanted well, I didn't know to want it in 2011, but I knew to I knew to know to want it by you know 2013 or so, and we never really had um, uh, the ability to cut out you know part of that counterparty risk, which is just the time it takes uh, from purchasing uh, Bitcoin to taking full sovereign control over it. So right now, you know, most of those transactions are settling around T plus one, uh, but. Uh, it, regardless of the size of the purchase, uh, but you know we'll be working to get that into the same day uh, over time. Again, from my personal story, it's not just 
you know, time of settlement is a really big deal because there's so many different, you know, we talked about earlier, the layer on, on top of layer on top of layer counterparty risk you take when you're with an exchange or any other way to buy Bitcoin um, is just that um, it's not just, you know, withdrawal limits. It's not just, um, you know, exchange hack risk. It could be jurisdictional. You know, I've had friends that, um, you know, here in Wyoming that bought Bitcoin, you know, before 2017 and between 2016 and 2018, uh, it was stuck. Not because you know Coinbase was hacked, not because you know they were doing anything nefarious, but because they read the money transmitter license rules in Wyoming and decided they couldn't do business there anymore, which included uh, allowing you to withdraw funds. And so people's funds mm. in Wyoming were locked up for two years. And because Wyoming's so small, most people have never <clears throat> heard of that. And then we changed the law in 2018, and then people got their money back, right? But if you think about what's going on in New York with proof of work and like, what could they do? You, you just have so many different risks that, you know, we say not your keys, not your Bitcoin. And at Unchained, we've been facilitating people, you know, taking custody of their coins. But when we look at that, we say every one of those coins was bought somewhere or mined somewhere, right? Everyone took a certain amount of risk getting it from wherever, whatever situation they were in before to where they ended up with and unchained. And wouldn't it be great if, you know, we could, how do we cut that down to the, you know, the bare minimum risk that someone could take when transferring dollars in order to get Bitcoin. And um, so, yeah, that's, uh, you know, what we'll be launching. We'll be in 26 States uh, at the time of launch for, you know, working to get all 50. Uh, but, it's pretty exciting. It's something that I've personally wanted for a long time and hoping that other people, you know, see the value in. It's awesome. It's awesome. Let's shift gears into some macro talk. Um, Parker, I asked you before we started chatting if there was any charts or anything that you wanted to kind of look at. You had told me that you think one of the most important charts out there is just the global central bank balance sheets. For people that are listening, describe why you think this is important. I'm going to throw it up on the screen for people that are joining us via YouTube. But talk to us about this chart. There's been a lot of talk about the Fed increasing interest rates um, and out of control inflation. And I think in the last meeting, the Fed increased interest rates 75 basis points. But what really matters is the dollar supply and all dollars. Uh, are created and destroyed by the Federal Reserve, and the size of the Fed's balance sheet is really what what dictates uh, dollar interest rates more so than than short term interest rates. Essentially, uh, that when the Fed increases short term interest rates, they do and can potentially seriously screw up um, some short term funding markets. But the dollar supply is really what what influences everything. So the, the Fed's balance sheet, so goes the Fed's balance sheet, um, uh, goes goes the world. Every other balance sheet that's that's dollar based or really just fiat based is levered to the feds. And that, you know, this is so interrelated to Bitcoin because I think oftentimes people intuitively come to understand why it is so destructive to have your money be printed, but it's really on either side of that equation. It's it's the process of creating money and eliminating money from the system um, on either side of that equation is destructive to the, the economic structure, that, that manipulating the money supply is really the fundamental problem. And what the Fed has signaled is that they're going to start to unwind the balance sheet, but despite the fact that they've been raising short-term interest rates, they they haven't really moved the needle at all. If you, if you look at the chart, um, it, it's a flat line effectively. It's, it's down, I think, like $30 billion, but they printed $5 trillion in the last two years. Um, it's a rounding error. And so that truthfully is the whole reason why bitcoin exists and that when we that when we look forward to what might come in the broader financial markets uh, and the potential disruption it is the fed's balance sheet that really uh, is is the greatest influencer and the fed signaled that they're going to start to unwind the 5 trillion the truth is they won't be able to um, but when it comes back to the energy discussion too it is that the fed increasing interest rates um, is going to do nothing to create more energy. Um, it's only going to uh, further impair those supply chains. And so, you know, like I think, you know, it's just whenever the Fed comes out and says anything that they're planning to do, it just reinforces why 
we do what we do in Bitcoin, not just what we do as Unchained, but I think what all Bitcoiners do in ter- terms of helping to, to spread the knowledge base. But I do think the Fed's balance sheet more so than what the Fed is doing in terms of raising short-term interest rates is really the more influential kind of driver of everything that happens in the market. And the, and the, and the relevant thing today is they, they really haven't done much, uh, but that they, they've signaled that they, that they will. And, and I don't believe that they're going to be able to uh, drain a lot of dollars out without um, breaking the system. But that what, what they choose to do from an actual balance sheet side is more consequential than anything. You would made the comment that as they're tightening, you think it's going to break supply chains and you know potentially even lead to further inflationary prints. I think this is in the realm of possible here. And I think that that's a very contrarian take to people that are heavily involved in financial markets for years and decades. They would say, we're on the cusp of a recession and we're probably going to see uh a lot of the interest rates reverse course that we might even see deflation here in the next six months. Walk us through your narrative, Parker, because it seems like you don't share that that belief. Yeah, I, I think that it's just a very common sense perspective, which is um, essentially the Fed is trying to destroy demand to bring prices down. Yes, uh, right, um, but. When you destroy demand, you can also destroy supply chains. And if you destroy supply chains and uh, producers' ability to produce, then um, you can end up in a much worse situation. So um, the demand for energy over time has proven to be very inelastic. Um, we need gasoline to, to, to get in a car, go anywhere to produce um, and deliver goods to market. And that, you know, just, just hearing things... Um, interacting with more people in the energy industry, just to kind of give a few anecdotes, but, but I hear it consistently is talking about how, um, and, and this is kind of also part of the, the function of ESG, but, but it'll, I think also has a, a big impact now is that there's been a large underinvestment in CapEx across the board in the oil and gas space. Um, and that a lot of the drilling is necessary to just sustain current demand. Um, but when you have a very tight and constrained market where if I went up to the Minneapolis Bitcoin meetup a few weeks ago and flying back, I sat next to a, a guy who'd been working on well sites for the past 42 days. And he was talking about how um, they, they were at max capacity. They, couldn't, they, they were starting to reduce the, the quality of people that they were hiring. Um, they couldn't keep people. They were paying people. They started to hire people straight out of high school. Um, paying them seventy five thousand as a straight out of high school job, and they couldn't keep people on on staff, um, and that basically the industry is at a maximum capacity, and such that if you start to make the costs of capital more expensive, uh, or if you start to massively reduce the um, you know reserves in the emergency reserves, and and start to artificially bring energy oil prices down specifically. You, you do two things. You impair the ability of producers to capture that price. Um, but then when you start to raise interest rates, you start to increase the cost of capital such that if people wanted to go finance more production activity, um, it now costs them more. What are you, what's going to happen in that environment where the producers are capturing less price, they can't hire people. Uh, you are actually going to get less of the goods and services to market than you actually need. And the things that are most inelastic are oil and gas, uh, and then the more refined products down market. And so, uh, but it all comes back from a very common sense perspective that, uh, you, you do not get more of these things by, by, um, essentially cutting off the capital, uh, or making the, cu- the capital significantly more expensive, uh, to, to finance these activities. And, you know, it's one of the problems of the fiat system as a whole, which is cheap debt is what has financed infrastructure, including in oil and gas. And so if you make that more expensive, you're, you're just going to impair the ability to, pr- to produce more of it. And, uh, and so I think that, you know, kind of that, that's what we'll see. People will actually need uh, as much natural resources and as much gasoline, as much, you know, power as they've ever have. Um, but less and less of it will be, you know, coming to market or, or not enough to meet the, the demand. So I don't, um, it's like the, the symptoms and the problems of money printing are vast. And I think that we're going to find it out in a bigger way uh, through this cycle. 
Will, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I won't, uh, you know, pretend to be able to hang with you and Parker when it comes to macro, but uh, I'll just say that, uh, you know, what Parker just said on top of, you know, supply chains that are already strained by shutting down an economy for two years, and you think that raising interest rates are, you know, going to, uh, going to help the situation seems, again, from a common sense perspective. I, I, I look at all the other you know, macro commentators, especially in the Bitcoin space, I listen to Parker and you and Lynn and others. Um, and uh, and then if I watch any mainstream news, I I just it, it does it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so which is which means you totally understand everything that's happening. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's the first step to understanding. Yes. Yeah, and, and I just think that you know, it's like anytime the Fed comes out and does anything, to, you know, it's just like. There's a very loud signal being sent that something's wrong, right? Oh, and, yeah. Uh, energy prices are up through the, through the roof. Even the United States, like if you look at you know natural gas prices, like Henry Hub, I believe it was like two two dollars an MCF, and I might get my units wrong, but it was like two dollars three years ago, and now it's nine dollars today, right? Um, what does that translate into? That translates into higher electricity prices, and it's aren't it's just starting to to ripple through. But, but I mean, but just it, look at that whopper. It's insane. It looks like a hyperinflation chart. Looks like a startup. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And so um, I think everyone feels it in their daily lives. Uh, I don't think that many people uh, connect it to the the issues with our money system. What's that one? This is natural gas in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Even if you look at the at the US prices too. And I think that Again, most people do not make this connection to the fact that that our money's broken, um, and you know it's kind of like it, it, it can be really difficult to kind of operate in an environment, um, not from an investment perspective. Although I'm sure everyone who's investing is chasing their tails as well. But when you know it's it just every single day, the more that happens, the more convicted and the more you know important Bitcoin kind of as a, as a project really, you know, it's like, I think we probably all feel that way, but, but more people figure it out. Um, and so it's like, I, I see the, um, kind of chaos that the fed and centralized institutions all over the world create, um, and that people have to start keying into it, but also people do as a function of the market test that, that what we're here for, of building Bitcoin and, helping deliver infrastructure that provides a more sound uh, monetary system is, is the most important that anybody could be working on. And that, that includes you in terms of just you know, kind of helping to expand the knowledge base around it. Um, so completely agree with you. It is, this is vital. I mean, when you just think about what it offers, which is settlement between any two parties, it doesn't matter who you are, who you know, to be able to transmit value instantly, uh, anywhere in the world, regardless of jurisdiction, and to physically take custody, to me, it, with, without there being any debasement, the terminal debasement is just indescribable. I don't know how people can't think that there that there's something just unbelievably massive here. But what, uh, what, what, what percentage of your audience do you think holds their own keys? Hmm. I, I bet you it's less than we would like to think, but I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. And the only reason I say that is because so much of our audience came from traditional finance yeah. and have, have come into it. And I think for some of them, they're just like, Hey, I buy into the idea that this, that maybe the money's broken and maybe I need to have a hedge against that particular event happening. And so they're probably just looking for something to have exposure to the upside, the asymmetric upside, and they just want to be able to do it in, in the easiest way possible. Uh, so we, we need to scare them off of paper Bitcoin as well. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying with the show and and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and talking about why I personally, I, I mean, that's not how I operate. I mean, mm-hmm. everything that you say, Parker and Will, like I'm, I'm with you 100%. Like, I think this is a way bigger deal you know what, Parker, your your take on this potentially continuing to blow out with respect to energy, I think is a way higher probability. And I'm not saying I completely agree with it, but I think it's a way higher probability than what, what most, because I think if you took 
Uh, most people, anybody on Wall Street, anybody who's a professional like hedge fund manager or whatever, they're saying we're going to have deep deflationary forces here in six months to a year, like deep. And I think in some areas, some some products and some types of services, I think that it, that may be true. But I think for energy specifically, look at Europe. Like it's it's saying the exact opposite. Um, there looks to be there looks like there's no end in sight for where that's going. Um, you've seen a little bit of a drop in oil recently, but you're not outside of like, like it continuing to to rip. And uh, I just think that it's an important consideration, and I think it's something people need to think about because I think it's in the realm of possible. I don't know if I would say it's my high my base case, but I think it's in the realm of possible. I mean, I, I think when you start to understand, um, and again, I don't pretend to be an expert, but but if you start to talk to energy professionals, uh, yeah. people actually in the field that, that understand the supply chains. It will, it, it is a consistent, we've underinvested massively and we are at max capacity. And that when you understand the, the disruptive impact of tightening financial conditions, um, you create, you, we already have a supply constraint issue and, and that only becomes worse, right? And so, or at least that's my perspective. And there was a, uh, a recent podcast that uh, Griffin Haby on, on Marty Ben's podcast that I encourage people to listen to where he specifically talked about, and he's a, he, he comes, he's a Bitcoin miner today, Griffin is, but he came from the oil and gas background where he basically said, we don't really know what the price of oil is today because they, uh, they are depleting the, emergency reserves in in massive proportion that's basically flooding the system yeah, yeah. with w- with oil that's not produced today at current cost right and then when you start to understand that producers are struggling to find the labor to expand capacity that's that's the core fundamental driver and anything that the the fed is doing to potentially quote destroy demand or increasing financing costs doesn't make the supply issue go in the right direction. Um, and so I do think, and I, and I talk, cause when I go around and, you know, educate about Bitcoin, the more I get involved in the um, kind of in the energy community or, or develop friendships and relationships in the energy world, uh, I've started to think about this a lot more, but, but oftentimes they'll ask me, you know, because they oftentimes they'll, they'll find their way to Bitcoin because it actually solves a problem for them before they actually understand the the money, the hard money dynamics of it. That all, they'll often ask me whether or not like Bitcoin is savings or it's money or an investment, and I I say it is the right way to think about it. And my view is that it's a better form of money. It might not operate like a better form of money, um, or or might not be perceived to that because of its volatility and different characteristics that don't line up well with what people have known money to be, but there is a reality that most people have taken money for granted and don't actually understand why the dollar is of value. Um, but that it is inevitable that people think about Bitcoin the first time that they buy it, or definitely if they're buying paper, bit Bitcoin, don't do that bad idea. Just buy the real thing. Um, that it's impossible not to think about it as an investment initially, that that, that is unavoidable. And that the the more that you go down the rabbit hole, listening to these shows, reading the Bitcoin standard, um, other resources on Bitcoin, when you get to the fundamental of it, you will start to see it as money. But that can't happen um, without going down that rabbit hole, and it certainly can't happen the first time that that you buy Bitcoin. And you know, a lot of people, I think, and you probably see this a lot in your world, Preston where people talk about how Bitcoin's a hedge to inflation. And now they don't understand why, hey, if Bitcoin's a hedge to inflation, why did it come down? And there's this whole like massive credit bubble and the dollar was deleveraging and everything's levered to the dollar. So it's perfectly reasonable there. But Bitcoin is not a hedge to inflation. It is the solution to inflation, the permanent solution that that it is. Inflation is a function of money creation. And when when money is free uh, or freer than free, as uh, as the people on CNBC famously once said, um, that this is what you get. You get economic distortion, economic disruption, economic imbalance, and the only way to restore that balance is by finding a better form of money. And that is what Bitcoin is, and that's why I just my construct of it is like when we think about uh, inflation, it's not just the function of of people printing money. It is that the supply chains and the economic distortion 
actually create supply and demand imbalances such that the goods that we actually need cannot be delivered to market. And you actually need a reliable form of money to coordinate all the inputs. Uh, and that's why just, you know, my view is it's Bitcoin is actually the solution to inflation, not a hedge to it. Amen. I just don't know how people can think anything other than that on a, on a long time frame, right? How can't you think that if you add more units into the system that the prices, and it's not linear. And I think this is Michael Saylor's big point where inflation is a vector of, of all these different things, depending on where you're taking the measurement at. But if you're continuing to add units into the system collectively on a global scale, like how can't people think that that's, that's what causes inflation? I, mean, I just think it's really straight straight and very obvious to your strategic well, they, they've control. been telling us for you know eight months that that doesn't cause inflation and uh and then they came around to it uh the, the fed just learned this uh and their <laughs> you know century plus uh uh you know existence that have just figured out that yes that is what actually causes inflation to uh parker's strategic petroleum reserve uh comment just to kind of give people a heads up so i'm looking at the chart for uh back in 2020 uh, there were 656 million barrels in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Today, we're at 464. So I think you could say about a third of it has been depleted just in the last two years and still aggressively being depleted to offset prices. But think about what that does too, because this is this is something very fundamental. It's kind of like, uh, it's the other side of printing money. They're printing oil right now, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. Because that those oil that were in the Strategic Reserves uh, they weren't produced today. They weren't produced at current cost. So they're flooding the market, right? And they're manipulating the price of oil down. Well, the actual price response, if you're working in a in a stable form of money regime, which we're not, um, the supply response, namely the price of oil going higher, is what incentivizes producers to be able to go produce more to capture those prices, such that when you're depleting the emergency reserves, you're, you're basically hitting the producers on both sides. You're, you're raising interest rates, increasing financing costs, and you're artificially reducing price, which you otherwise could be capturing to go form new capital in the form of rigs and wells and new production. And so now the fed's not releasing the, the, the reserves, but these two things are incredibly destructive to new capital formation, which would translate into uh, an increase in supply to alleviate price. So it's just, it's like they're, they're chasing their tails and, and we all will be chasing our tails uh, until we can, can, can do away with the entire, you know, kind of uh, scheme. current and scheme, <laughs> legacy structure, centralization, right? Cause this is also as a function of, uh, of the, the perils of centralization at many different layers. So yeah, it's, it's a, um, well, it's incredibly unpredictable too, right? Cause that's a political decision that's being made to deplete the reserves is as if they're just, you know, hard forking, hard forking rules. And you never know what you're going to get going back to our proof of stake conversation. When you make that a possibility, you make it incredibly unstable, you know, and an incredibly, you know, difficult area to operate in. What do you think that oil producers would produce if the barrel of oil costs five dollars versus three? Right, and it's like, yeah. well, what's the only thing that's caused the or not the only thing, but what's a big thing that's caused those those prices to come down? The U.S. government selling oil, and it it is functionally competing with the oil and gas industry, and it's so incentivizing they, more consumption because people have a price that they can afford it at three and not at five. So yeah. you're incentivizing further consumption, which is you know, like you're just warping the incentive structure of free and open markets, period. Right. And, and, yeah. and, and look, we, we should all want cheap energy. Right. Uh, and so it's not like we're I'm not, you know, saying like, oh, well, I wish the oil still cost, you know, $120 a barrel and the gasoline still costs $5 um, versus coming down. It's, it's that energy abundance is the key to reducing energy prices. And I think the point that you brought up about Jeff Boo's comment is like the scarcity of money is actually what creates the abundance of all other goods, including energy. Amen. Um, because 
because money is is the input required to coordinate all of the the energy inputs to actually extract it. And so uh, when you manipulate things, you ultimately get far worse outcomes in the end rather than just letting the free market work. Guys, I could talk to you all night. Um, this was brilliant. Uh, can you give people a handoff to anything that you guys want to highlight, your Twitter feeds, any of that stuff, and we'll throw it into the show notes. Sure. Um, I'm at Will Cole on Twitter. Uh, you can visit us at unchained.com uh, if you're looking to um, you know, find a way to not be subject to withdrawal limits or get your funds locked up for an excessive amount of time. Uh, look forward to our announcement on Saturday the 27th around our uh, new trading tool that is being released um, and a little bit over half the United States. Yeah, and uh, I'm at Parker A. Lewis uh, on Twitter. Um, I talk about ESG and I, uh, I run a lot of meetups and uh, we help people hold their own private keys. So people can check out our website, unchained.com and yeah, look out for, for our announcement uh, during that block boom. And if you want to hold your own keys, uh, come to unchained.com. You can schedule a consultation, but uh, that's what our mission is to help more and more people do that and to, to help uh, people uh, get off Coinbase and, and avoid the exchange altogether. And the more that people do that, the less they'll have to worry about paper Bitcoin. Love it. Guys, thank you so much for your time. This was a blast. Thanks, Preston. Thanks, Preston. Obviously, the time frame for this window of the bull market, I think, is closing rapidly. I really expect the, the real economy to decelerate rapidly into 2023. So uh, enjoy these next few months because I think it can be a rocky season to 2023.